The grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us join together in our call to worship. Jesus calls us to servant ministry. We must be willing to support others, not counting the cost or rewards. Pretense, disharmony, greed have no place in discipleship. Serving God means receiving each person as though they are a beloved child. Lord, help us to truly become your disciples. Create in us hearts for ministries of compassion and kindness. Yet let us join together in our first hymn, Like a Child. child love would send to reveal and to mend like a child and a friend jesus comes like a child we may find claiming heart soul and mind like a child strong and kind jesus comes like a child we would meet ragged clothes dirty feet like a child on the street Jesus comes like a child we once knew coming back into view like a child born anew Jesus comes like a child born to pray and to show us the way like a child here to stay Jesus comes like a child we receive all that love can conceive like a child we believe Jesus comes. Please be seated. The love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. It is a joy for us uh, to be together today. Those who are present, we have a, what we almost, a full house today again. Good, good news. Uh, welcome to those of you who are live streaming, those listening in on CKWR radio. Um, and uh, yeah, and those who will be listening in on YouTube after the fact. Every time I say CKWR radio, I had a moment there where I, what was that old television show, WKRP in Cincinnati? <laughs> And I had this fear, I had this fear that I'm actually going to say WKRP some Sunday. <laughs> so the, the, those young folks in the congregation will have no clue what we're talking about. I'm, I'm revealing my age. <laughs> welcome, welcome to all of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Our prayer has already begun in our gathering and in our singing. I'd like to pray using some words. Loving Spirit, you are a God of hospitality and grace. In Jesus Christ, you poured out your life on behalf of the world, and you have welcomed us into your sacred and divine presence. But you've welcomed not only us, but also others, those whom we fail to notice sometimes, like the people on the fringes of society, those whom Jesus went out to embrace, went out to befriend, went out to love. We belong to you, O oh God, all of us. You receive us as we are, flaws and all, and you call us to become something more than we can perceive. 
you invite us to participate with you in what we can only describe as a mystery, you use us in the unfolding of your sacred story. Call us out from the protectiveness of self, we pray, that we may open ourselves to the other and enact and embody the kindness of Christ in the world. Refresh your church, we pray, with a vision of life so caught up in your love that we become beacons of hospitality, welcoming others as you have welcomed us. We offer these prayers, both spoken and unspoken, in the spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who taught the disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be your name. Your Your kingdom kingdom come. come. Your Your will will be done done on earth earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive forgive those who sin against us. us. Save us from from the time of trial and and deliver us us from from evil. evil. For the kingdom, kingdom, the power, power, and the glory glory are yours, now now and forever. forever. Amen. I have good news for you today. The world needs some good news, I think. The good news, which you already know, but which I remind you of, is that in Jesus Christ, you are loved. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, you are freed. God is still working on us. God is still working on the church. This is a gift of God's grace. And to God, we give thanks and we give praise. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. gospel story from today, the disciples are arguing amongst themselves about who is greater, who is first, and they go back and forth for quite a while arguing. And it reminded me a lot of my own kids and how they seem to be constantly in competition with each other. I'm not sure. Um, what we've taught them. I think sometimes as adults, we uh, focus so much on striving to be the best, to be competent and good leaders, and at the head of our careers, that they do the same and they imitate us, and they seem to be always worried about um, who we love more and who is better than the other. And it reminded me a lot of the Judy Bloom book. I read some Judy Bloom books when I was little um, called The Pain and the Great One. And so Hugh and I today are going to read this book to you. And it reminds us a little bit about how it seems to be our tendency to um, compete with each other, but maybe we can think about how we can work together and really what it does mean to be the greatest. The pain. My brother is a pain. He won't get out of bed in the morning. Mom has to carry him in to the kitchen. He opens his eyes when he smells his cornflakes. 
He should get dressed himself. He's six. He's in first grade. But he's so pokey. Daddy has to help him, or he'd never be ready in time, and he'd miss the bus. He cries if I leave without him. Then mom gets mad and yells at me, which is another reason why my brother's a pain. He's got to be first to show mom his schoolwork. She says, ooh, and ah, over all his pictures, which aren't great at all, but just ordinary first grade stuff. At dinner, he picks at his food. He's not supposed to get dessert if he doesn't eat his meat, but he always gets it anyway. When he takes a bath, my brother, the pain, powders the whole bathroom and never gets his face clean. Daddy said he's learning to take care of himself. I say he's a slob. My brother, the pain, is two years younger than me, so how come he gets to stay up as late as I do? Which isn't really late enough for anyone in third grade anyway. I asked mom and daddy about that. They said, you're right, you're, you are older, and you should stay up later. So they tucked the pain into bed, I couldn't wait for the fun to begin. I waited and waited and waited, but Daddy and Mom just sat there reading books. Finally, I shouted, I'm going to bed. We thought you wanted to stay up later, they said. I did, but without the pain, there's nothing to do. Remember that tomorrow, Mom said, and she smiled. But the next day, my brother was a pain again. When I got a phone call, he danced all around me, singing stupid songs at the top of his lungs. Why does he have to act that way? And why does he always want to be garbage man when I build a city out of blocks. Who needs him knocking down buildings with his dumb old trucks? And I would really like to know why the cat sleeps on Payne's bed instead of mine, especially since I am the one who feeds her. This is the meanest thing of all. I don't understand how Mom can say the pain is lovable. She's always kissing him and hugging him and doing disgusting things like that. And Daddy says the pain is just what they've always wanted. Yuck. I think they love him better than me. The Great One. My sister thinks she's so great just because she's older, which makes Daddy and Mom think she's really smart. But I know the truth. My sister's a jerk. She thinks she's great just because she can play the piano, and you can tell the songs are real ones. But I like my songs better, even if nobody ever heard them before. My sister thinks she's so great <clears throat> just because she can work the can opener, which means she gets to feed the cat, which means the cat likes her better than me, just because she feeds her. My sister thinks she's so great just because Aunt Diana lets her watch the baby and tells her how much the baby likes her. And all the time, the baby is sleeping in my dresser drawer, which Mom has fixed up like a bed for when the baby comes to visit. And I'm not supposed to touch him, even if he's in my drawer, and gets changed on my bed. My sister thinks she's so great just because she can remember phone numbers, and when she dials, she never gets the wrong person. And when she has friends over, they build whole cities out of blocks. I like to be garbage, man. I zoom my trucks all around. So what if I knock down some of their buildings? 
It's not fair that she always gets to use the blocks, I told mum and dad. They said, you're right. Today, you can use the blocks all by yourself. Well, I'm going to build a whole city without you, I told the great one. Go ahead, she said. Go build a whole province without me. See if I care. So I did. I built a whole country all by myself. Only it's not the funnest thing to play blocks alone. Because when I zoomed my trucks and knocked the buildings down, nobody cared but me. Remember that tomorrow, Mum said when I told her I was through playing blocks. But the next day we went swimming. I can't stand my sister when we go swimming. She thinks she's so great just because she can swim and dive, as in isn't afraid to put her face in the water. I'm scared to put mine in, so she calls me baby, which is why I have to spit water at her and pull her hair and even pinch her sometimes. And I don't think it's fair for Daddy and Mom to yell at me because none of it's my fault, but they yell anyway. Then Mom hugs my sister and messes with her hair and does other disgusting things like that. And da the, Daddy says the Great One is just what they've always wanted. Yuck! I think they love her better than me. I wonder how God experiences the way that we interact with each other as we seem to compete back and forth, trying to get first position. And I wonder what would happen if we looked at each other in a different way and looked at each other in a way that we saw greatness and value and worth in everyone that we met. Let us think about that this week as we live out our lives at home and at school and in the church and the community, how we can all lift each other up. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a child and put it among them, and taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the witness of the early church. St. Thomas Aquinas once said, Fear is such a powerful emotion for humans that when we allow it to take over within us, it drives compassion right out of our hearts. Change, transition, uncertainty, chaos, and earth-shattering news all create a sense of fear. So it is fitting that today's gospel reading helps us look at this very human emotion. In today's gospel passage, Jesus continues to teach discipleship. He does so by first sharing his own vulnerability, by telling the disciples that he would be betrayed and killed. 
the disciple's reaction to his vulnerability is fear. They get confused and scared. They try to banish their fear by making themselves feel powerful, by arguing about who would be first. The typical human response to vulnerability is to seek security, to establish our own status by claiming the right to be first, to make ourselves feel worthy, and even to retreat into our competence. When Jesus asks them what they are arguing about, embarrassed about their trivial argument, they keep silent. To get through to the disciples, to combat their confusion, discomfort, and silence, Jesus chooses to use children as an example. To try to get the the disciples to understand what he expects of them. He is trying to prepare them for his absence. For when they will be called to carry on his radical ministry. Jesus saw and acknowledged so many people in his encounters and travels that most of the rest of society, even his disciples, chose to ignore. In our story today, we are reminded that Jesus had a soft spot for children. He saw them, he made them feel included and worthy. To understand what this really means, how countercultural it was, we need to understand the status of children in first century Palestinian culture. Art and children's illustrations that often depict Jesus welcoming the little children do not give a realistic picture of what the situation was really like. Jesus was not embracing angelic-looking, chubby-cheeked children dressed in their Sunday best. First-century Palestinian children didn't exactly take bubble baths every night. Before they got their hair braided and got tucked into their Pottery Barn kids' matching sheets, and got red good night moon to the glow of their hungry caterpillar nightlight. Children in Jesus' time were not idealized as they are today. The center of their parents' and grandparents' lives, dressing them in designer clothes, trying to get them into the best gifted or French immersion programs, or making sure that they were eating a well-balanced organic diet or being chauffeured after school between music lessons and sports team activities. In reality, there was no sentimentality about childhood in first century Palestine because children or childhood was actually a time of terror. Children in those days only really had value as replacement adults. But until then, they were more like mongrel dogs than they were beloved members of a family. And they weren't even really housebroken. They just kind of leaked everywhere and they died far too often. Children were dirty and useless and often unwanted. And to teach his disciples about greatness and hospitality, Jesus put not a chubby-faced angelic child, but this kind of child in the center. He embraces this kind of child into his arms and says, when you welcome the likes of this child, you welcome me. In a culture where children were of no consequence, given no value and considered socially invisible, 
Jesus cradles a dirty, smelly, rejected little child into his arms and says, when whoever embraces one of these children as I do embraces me and far more than me, the God who sent me. By doing so, Jesus makes children visible, just as he made lepers visible and women visible. Jesus, even though a man and a bachelor, was not uncomfortable around children and their mess and their noise, their snotty noses, their screeches and cries, their temper tantrums, and inopportune giggles didn't faze him at all. He just worked them into his teaching. Jesus never asked their parents to please take them out to the nursery because they were a distraction. On the contrary, when his disciples scolded people for bringing their children to church, Jesus was angry and annoyed at the disciples, finding their attitude toward children unacceptable. The kingdom belongs to such as these, he said. They are full-fledged citizens of God's realm, not later, but right now. Wow, what a lesson in discipleship. Not only has Jesus hit the disciples with earth-shattering news, he again turns their thinking and ours inside out and upside down. If we want to hear God's calling to servanthood, then interact with, pay attention to, and support the needs and rights of children. There will be no payback with them. They have no status, no influence, no income, which makes them great in God's eyes. Children remain the most vulnerable among us, perhaps with more rights than they held in first century, but such rights are notoriously difficult to defend, especially against domestic abuse dysfunction, and outright parental incompetence, not to mention predators of all types. Opting for parenthood can still be perceived as a bad career move. Even church positions dedicated to teaching children and youth are not among the most highly coveted or esteemed Daycare workers, ECEs, and EAs are in high demand, but often poorly paid. Some exclusive residential settings attempt to exclude children altogether. Some of the clothing sold in our retail stores are produced by child labor. Many children continue to be enslaved within the sex industry. If we were willing to hear it, today's story can help us come face to face with such difficult realities, leading us to active repentance of turning around to a new way of living and resistance to take the easy way in relation to our children, in our families, in our churches, and in society. Since children had no social status whatsoever in ancient Israel, Jesus was clearly stating a reversal of the social order by making the least first and the first last. Jesus was also seeking to restore health to those who were sick and disabled, as well as dignity and value to children and women and outcasts. When we consider Jesus' act of elevating children to the center of his teaching, we are caused to think about the civil rights movements when both black children and black women 
played a crucial role in dismantling Jim Crow segregation in the United States. The name of Linda Brown, a school-aged child in Missouri, will be immortalized in the historic record of the American legal system after her father, Reverend Oliver Brown, fought to register his daughter in the all-white elementary school. His attempts to give his daughter equal rights at a good education resulted in integration in the schools and overthrew an unjust segregation system that had been in place for over half a century. Let us consider the unjust ways that black youth have been separated out, profiled, arrested, and killed because of the color of their skin. We think about how Emmett Till's death as a young boy elevated his memory to a status that has inspired all future generations to seek, secure, and celebrate racial justice. In the summer of 1955, Emmett of Chicago was visiting his grandparents for the summer in Mississippi. He played a childish prank on a white female candy store owner by saying, bye babe, as he left the store with his friends, trying to impress his new friends. That night, Emmett was taken from his grandparents' home by the KKK. Mercilessly tortured, killed, and thrown into the Tallahatchie River. Emmett's mother insisted on an open casket. And the photo of the unrecognizably mut mutilated body to be published by Jet magazine. Shocked mourners passed by the casket saw the horror of the body alongside the photo of a handsome boy wearing a hat. Nothing could have had more effect in showing the world the brutality of the Jim Crow segregation. As we anticipate Orange Shirt Day on September 30th, we consider the thousands and thousands of Indigenous children in Canada who were torn away from their families, from their culture and traditions, and forcibly placed in residential schools run by the Canadian government and our churches. We are faced with the torture, abuse, and death that these children underwent at these schools as their unmarked graves are being revealed. Did the church follow Jesus' command to welcome these children in the name of Christ? Since children and youth under the age of 18 cannot vote in Canada or the US, their voice on public issues is not counted. Yet children and teens around the world are making their voices heard related to climate justice and social justice issues. We think about environmental activist Greta Thunberg and the demonstrations she has organized and inspired around the world. We think about the extraordinary march of our lives organized and executed by high school youth in Washington, D.C. on March 24, 2018, following the killing of 17 students and wounding of 17 others at a high school in Parkland, Florida. Their aim was to persuade the lawmakers of Washington about the urgent need for effective legislation regarding gun control and to stop such brutal attacks in the schools. We consider how the treatment of these children, the least of us, has marked our history as humans. And the elevation of these children encourages us to change the way we live and treat each other. If we are to stop and really think about these children. The moral lessons 
that their situations and their leadership teaches us, those of us who are compassionate enough to be moved can, can bring justice through our servant leadership. It is not usually our first instinct in, lead, in a leadership position to empty ourselves of self-worth and pride. Today is a perfect day to be reminded about how Jesus led. His way of leadership differs from most of our default patterns. As a congregation, we are about to ordain three new ruling elders to serve on session as servant leaders. As they stand at the front of the church in a few minutes, in front of everyone present, we are witness to the visible risk being taken by Kathleen and Sean and Kathy and all the other elders who are renewing their vows today. They are stepping out of their comfort zone to take on a challenge, to serve Christ in the congregation and community. Being given the title elder is not about status or placing them above the rest of the congregation. It is about them dedicating their time and passion and gifts in service for the ministry and mission of the church. As our elders get ordained shortly, perhaps we are all to be inspired to take on a new pattern that is not about proving ability or competence or worth, but instead about affirming the worth of everyone Jesus calls us to serve and about sharing in their vulnerability. Amen. Let us join together in our next hymn, number 648. I'm going to live so God can use me. seated. We come to uh, the, the, the part in our service where we proceed with the ordination of our new elders. This will feel like a bit of a formal service. This is a service that the Presbyterian Church in Canada um, asks that we do when we ordain elders. There are a v- varieties of gifts but the same spirit. There are varieties of services, but the the same same Lord. Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the the same same God who who activates activates all of them in everyone. everyone. To each one is given a gift by the Spirit to use use it for the the common common good. good. Together we are the body of Christ. 
and individually members of it. Though we have different gifts, together we are called to be the church with a ministry in the world which is led by the risen Christ. I'd like to invite uh, uh, Eric to come forward to, on behalf of the session, uh, introduce the, the, uh, those who are to be ordained and to let us know the process that brought us to this point today. Thank you, Eric. Good morning. On behalf of a session, I have been asked to communicate the following. Knox was scheduled to hold its biennial election of elders in 2021. Voting ballots were distributed to professing members of Knox Waterloo on May 9th, with completed ballots to be received by June 20th. A discernment team of session met and considered the call of the congregation. After prayer and consideration, the nominees were approached and invited to consider serving as ruling elders. In July, the names approved by session to serve as elders were Lori Carter, Kathleen Ford, Sean Jackson, Kathy Sove, Deb Schlichter, Sue Senior, Greg Senema, and Jen Yesis. Lori, Deb, Sue, Jen, and Greg have been ordained as elders and will renew their service on session. On behalf of the session and the people of this congregation, I, I um, am pleased to present to you Kathleen, Sean, and Kathy, and request that you now proceed to ordain them as elders and admit them to the session. Thank you, Eric. I'd like to invite Kathy and Kathleen and Sean to join us at the front. Peace be with you. with you. Listen to what the Presbyterian Church in Canada believes concerning the ministry of ruling elders. All ministries of the church proceed from, from and are sustained by the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the operation of God's word and spirit, the church is gathered, equipped, and sent out to participate in this ministry. All members of the church are called to share the gospel with the world and to offer to God the worship and service that are due to the Creator from the creation, through Christ, the only mediator, until the fullness of time. That the church may continually be renewed and nurtured for ministry, that Christ furnishes the church with pastors and teachers, requiring and enabling the church to discern and to confirm by ordination those whom are called to this pastoral and teaching office, the standards of Christ's church are entrusted in a special degree of responsibility to their, our, care. But besides the ministers of the word, others in the church have gifts for government and, are, and more than just government, but including government, and are called to join with the minister in the government and oversight and care of the church. And these are called ruling elders. The Presbyterian Church in Canada is bound only to Jesus Christ, the Church's King and Head. The scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the written Word of God testifying to Christ, the Living Word, are the canon of all doctrine by which Christ rules our faith and life. We acknowledge our history, our historic continu continuity with the Holy Catholic Church and our doctrinal heritage in the ecumenical creeds and the confessions of the Reformation. Our subordinate standards are the Westminster Confession of Faith as adopted in 1875 and 1889. The, the Declaration of Faith Concerning Church and Nation of 1954 and Living Faith as adopted in 1998 as such doc and such doctrine as the church in obedience to scripture and under the promised guidance of the holy spirit 
may yet confess the church's continuing function of reformulation, reformulating the faith. Cassie, Kathleen, and Sean, that your faith in God and your integrity of purpose may be declared before God and before God's people, we ask you in terms of this preamble to answer the questions appointed for all who would enter the office of ruling elder. I'd like to invite those who are returning to eldership, if you wish, to stand. Some of you are at home, some of you are in the congregation. So the others who are renewing your service to session, if you would like to stand and reaffirm um, the vows of your ordination, you may participate in this as well. Do you love God, creator, made known in Jesus Christ, to whom the Spirit witnesses in the scriptures? If so, please answer, I do. Do you acknowledge the subordinate standards of the church, promising to uphold doctrine under the continual illumination and correction of the Holy Spirit, speaking in the scriptures, and to be guided in fostering Christian discipleship, worship, and service among the people. Do you accept the government of this church by sessions, presbyteries, synods, and general assemblies? And do you promise to share in and to submit yourself to all lawful oversight therein, and to follow no divisive course, but to seek the peace and unity of Christ among your people and throughout the universal church? If so, please answer, I do. In accepting the office of elder, do you promise to perform your duties in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, striving to build up the church and to strengthen its mission in the world? If so, please say, I do. May the Lord bless you and give you grace as you keep these vows. Amen. You've just heard the, the elders promise to serve in the Spirit of Christ the congregation. It's an important part of this day that the congregation also make a promise to support your elders, to pray for them and to care for them. So I'd like to invite the, if you consider yourself a part of the Knox community, please to stand as you are able, and you can do so at home as well. I have a question for you. The ordination of elders in a congregation, if their leadership and ministry is to be fruitful, involve res involves responsibilities for both the elders and the people of the church. These questions, therefore, we direct to you, the Knox community, so that you may renew your participation in what is shared ministry. Do you receive Kathleen? Sean and Kathy as elders chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead in the way of Christ? If so, please answer, we do. We do. do you agree to encourage them, to pray for them, and to respect their decisions as they guide you in the spirit of Jesus Christ? If so, please answer, we do. May God bless you and give you the grace to honor the promises that you have just made. Please be seated. We come to the part of the service where we have a prayer for those who are new, being newly ordained. And it's terribly unfortunate in these COVID days that we can't be intimate <laughs> in a way. Normally, we'd ask you to come forward and we'd have a nice cushion on the step for you and you would kneel and the elders of the church would gather and we would place our hands on your shoulders or your back or maybe your head and we would pray for you. We can't do that today because of present COVID circumstances. But we can, we can pray for you in a way that is meaningful, we hope. Um, this might feel weird to you, um, and you don't have to participate in this. But what we could do is we could pretend, and I invite the whole congregation, even those of you who are listening at home, 
you can pretend that you're placing your hand on those who are being ordained. Sometimes it would just be elders who do this. I'm going to invite the whole congregation to participate in this because we're all participating in this act of prayer. So when I start the prayer, if you wish, you can just reach out your hands and pretend you're placing your hand on the back of Kathy or Kathleen or Sean. And because we're pretending, maybe you can put your hand on all three of them <laughs> at once. <laughs> And this way, you, we want you to really feel the prayers and the support of this community who's called you to this service and whom you are called to serve in response. So, as you wish, please reach out your hands and let's pray for these people. We celebrate with you, loving God, the gifts of creation for calling us into community, for showing us your love and life in Jesus Christ, for guiding us in the presence and power of your spirit. We are grateful. God of past, present, and future, in every age you have chosen servants to help lead your people. We thank you for Greg, Lori, Sue, Deb, and Jen for their continuation of their faithful service on session. And today we thank you for calling Kathleen and Sean and Kathy to serve as ruling elders. By the power of your Holy Spirit, develop in them gifts of ministry. May they have the same mind that was in Christ, serving you in the world as long as they are able through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Kathy, may the Spirit of God rest on you and uphold you all the days of your life. Amen. Kathleen, may the Spirit of God rest on you and uphold you all the days of your life. Amen. Sean, may the Spirit of God rest upon you and uphold you all the days of your life. Amen. We pray together. Let's say these words together. God of God grace, grace who baptizes us into union with Christ, who calls us by name, and who invites us to share in the ministry of healing and peace. We pray for courage and wisdom for our elders, that together we may show your love to all the world in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. Kathy, Kathleen, and Sean, in the name of Jesus Christ, and by the authority invested in me by the Presbytery of Waterloo, Wellington, I now declare you to have been ordained as ruling elders, and I admit you to the session of Knox Waterloo Presbyterian Church. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through him. May peace be with you all. Thank you. Peace be with you. I kind of feel like clapping. Like this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is big. <laughs> My apologies to those who don't like clapping in church, but it just felt like something was needed there. <laughs> Uh, we just need to celebrate and show with our bodies as well as with our hearts and our minds. Yeah, we have to do that sometimes. Uh, that was lovely. Thank you. Thank you all for participating in that. Um, we're going to proceed with our time of offering. We don't pass the plates here. We invite. Um, we have a little box on the table for those of you who brought... Uh, an envelope or a gift to the church, you can place that in the offering table at the back. Um, E-transfer is like the best thing for the office staff. E-transfer is great if you'd like to, to give that way. Or, of course, it's always wonderful for new folks to sign up on PAR, which makes an automatic uh, payment on your behalf each month. So, but we don't just give monetarily, we give in so many ways. We've just had three people in a whole session say, I'm going to give this way. <laughs> we give in so many ways. So let's enjoy some music by Mary Catherine and uh, not enjoy it. Well, I guess we enjoy the music, but it's meant to 
touch us in a way that brings us to a deeper place, a spirit place, one of those thin places. So let's enter that sacred space together as we ponder the ways we give gifts to God. for all of your gifts, for all of the gifts which come from you, which we share with one another, we are so grateful. In the spirit of Christ, we offer prayers of deep gratitude for the things we recognize and for the things we don't always notice. In the spirit of Christ, we pray, amen. Please be seated. Thank you, MC. And thank you, Courtney. 
Thank you to Greg for reading scripture today, for Eric for participating, to our elders. A thank you to our faithful tech team at the back today. We have Kathleen and Maeve, and we've got Mark and Ben. So grateful to you. Thank you to the folks at WKRP Radio, <laughs> <laughs> at CKWR Radio. Uh, thank you to the folks who manage the internet at the church that makes all of this possible, allowing us to live stream. Thank you to the people at YouTube that create space for us to upload our videos so people can enjoy them after the fact. So many people to thank, so many people to thank, and I'm forgetting all kinds of people to thank. But I want to thank you, all of you, at home, in your cars, in the sanctuary today, for being a part of this service of worship. This has been all the more meaningful because you have been a part of it. A couple of quick announcements, a financial update on uh, what's been happening at Knox went out in your This Week at Knox email. Um, we're making ends meet, but of course we've been relying on government grants which will soon end, so please keep that in consideration. Thank you to those of you who give so faithfully and financially to support the ministries of, of Knox Church. Uh, steering team and volunteers for Logos, they've been really busy these days getting ready for a kickoff date on October the 7th. Thank you to the team and those who are getting ready to welcome our children and young people in our midst. Uh, if you have any questions about Logos, contact Barb Gadet. There's going to be a youth walk in the park next Saturday. Contact Carol for more information on that. Uh, and also you can contact Courtney for more information on a new initiative um, which is reaching out to um, uh, young adults. This is not to replace, it's to work in tandem with Food for Thought. It's a supplemental program, they're working together uh, for young adults and if you want more information on that then you know who to talk to. In two weeks we've got a special Sunday coming up, it's going to be Climate Sunday uh, we've invited uh, a climate specialist who also happens to be a Presbyterian minister, Joan Masterton. Uh, we're so grateful she can be present. And in the week leading up to that Sunday service, the Global Partners Committee has organized a number of conversations, climate conversations to be held through the week in various time slots. We're hoping that that many of you will take the opportunity to learn something new about climate and to reflect on how we can faithfully respond um, in, a, in a Christian way to the challenges that we're facing with climate change. If you can't, the link to the uh, climate conversations went out in your This Week at Knox email. Um, if you're not getting that email, let us know, we can sign you up. Um, I can actually tell who opens and doesn't open. I, I have a secret way of just determining that, so I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, we hope that many of you can participate in those climate conversations. It, they're using a really great resource for that, so hope you can, you can be a part. PWSND, Presbyterian World Service and Development, that's the um, development and emergency relief dimension of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. They're hoping to raise $20,000 for food security programs around the world with, um, uh, with their Ride for Refuge. You can actually walk for refuge as well. Uh, we want to get a Knox team to raise some money, uh, and that's going to be on October the 2nd. If you go to our website and click on, it's part of the scrolling banner, the Ride for Refuge, you can click on it and it shows you a map of a route that you can use as well. So thanks to the team for keeping us connected with this global ministry. And Connecting Together is starting up again. So grateful. This ministry has been amazing. It's touched so many lives la last year. We're so grateful for the folks who provided leadership and excellent programming for this, for this uh, ministry. The kickoff is October the 18th. Contact Kathy Sauve, newly ordained elder of Knox Waterloo, for more information on this. Uh, and we also give thanks to uh, our... Usher, ushering team and our greeting team. There's still, I can see some of them standing out at the back. Thank you, folks, for being part of the Ministry of Hospitality and Safety here at Knox Waterloo. We are grateful to you. Um, departure today will be coordinated as it is every Sunday after the benediction uh, we in, and the closing song. We invite you just to stay in place 
and an usher will start at that back and go to the front and do it row by row, aisle by aisle. Uh, so just wait until you are um, told to, uh, to make your way to the, to the door. Oh, one thing about reserving your seats online. Uh, I know it's, a compli- it's not an easy system. When you get onto it, it it's, it's, it's pre- they don't make this for churches, so we kind of had to adapt a kind of system that's used by movie theaters and concert venues. If you don't get a confirmation email, then something's gone wrong and it hasn't registered. So make sure you get, do all the steps until you get a confirmation email, and that way your seat is totally reserved. Um, if you need help on walking through the process, Charlene knows the system, Ruth knows the system, I know the system, we can, we can help you out to learn the proper way to make sure you get your seat. Because we want you to have your seat. If you think you've reserved it, we want you to have it. Uh, and I just name uh, something for you to carry in prayer in, in the days and weeks to come. Um, I invite you to pray for the family of Helen, Helen Litwiller. I officiated at her funeral service earlier this week. It was a private family ceremony. Uh, and also, I invite you, we invite you to pray for Barb and Ken Wise on the sudden and tragic death of their son, Jordan. Uh, Ken and Barb are not ready to receive phone calls or receive visits at this time, but they do welcome your compassion and your heartfelt prayers for them these days. Thank you for that. It's time for us to sing. In a spirit of deep prayer, we offer ourselves to God in a beautiful hymn, 637, Take My Life. God who dances in creation, who embraces us with human love, who shakes our lives like thunder, bless us and drive us out with humility to serve one another and fill the world with her justice and love. Amen. To Mamina, to Mamina, to Mamina, to Mamina, so that send me, Lord, send me, Jesus, send me, Jesus, send me, Jesus, send me, lead me, Lord, lead me, Jesus, lead me.
I'm Hugh Donnelly, one of the ministers at Knox Waterloo. Thank you for being a part of the worshiping community today. You can find us online at knoxwaterloo.ca, and you are always welcome to call us at 519-886-4150. This broadcast is made possible by you, listeners and friends of Knox, who support Knox's broadcast ministry. Please consider making a donation in gratitude as you are able, and may the peace of Christ be with you.